In this third statistical vocabulary video, we're going to talk about frequency, frequency tables, and levels of measurement. In addition to some of the vocabulary, we're actually going to do a little bit of calculator work, so make sure that you have a calculator in front of you so you can follow along and type things in as I do. So, we are going to basically talk about rounding and there's a little bit of rounding information given in the book, but I am actually gonna post something called the rounding fact or frequently asked questions on my Moodle page. I would go look that up and see if you had any questions about the standard rounding procedures. You should look at that document and you know maybe catch up on how to do some simple rounding to whole numbers, rounding to decimals, scientific notation, what's expected when we have percentages and how should we round those? What if the number is really small or really big? So please read the rounding fact if you need any more information on how to round things uh, pretty, pretty standardly. Now, what is a level of measurement? Well, we're a, lev a level of measurement is the way a set of data is measured. And so these are four different typical scales that are used to measure things. So you can either use a nominal, ordinal, interval, or a ratio. Now, these four uh, categories kind of go from, it's hard to say whether they go from worst to best, but they get more specific as we go from the first one to the last one. So we're gonna start off with a nominal scale. A nominal scale is based on categories, colors, names, labels, along with yes or no. So a nominal scale is categorical. If you wanna talk about an ordinal scale, well, it's like a nominal scale, except that it has ranking. So if I wanted to talk about colors of, a, of an iPhone, the colors of an iPhone are nominal. And they're nominal because I can say they're, they're, the phone is, is red or black or silver, but that's not any kind of ranking at all. Whereas an ordinal scale, you can say that, well, this cell phone, this iPhone is the best and this is good. You have a ranking scale based on your categories, but the categories are um, non-numerical. So that would be saying like, oh, this is a, a must watch. So I've seen, I've seen movie reviews that do not use numbering systems, but they say like, oh, this is a rent. This is a must watch. This is a must watch in the theater, or this is one to avoid. So you have four different levels there where must watch in the theater is the top level and the worst is the avoid. Um, interval. Interval builds on the ordinal scale, except they use numbers instead of uh, just a ranking system. So the interval scale has uh, like uh, a numbering system that some of you may not be familiar with, but really is apt here is a credit score. Because a credit score is a three digit number based on how you like a history or a score based on how well you've saved money or do you have any like unpaid bills and stuff like that and a, a really good score is in the 800s and a really poor score is under 600 and what's important about the interval scale is that there is no zero so you're not going to have a credit score of zero you would just have no credit score if you get put on the map with a credit score because you have a checking account or a bank account, you wouldn't have a credit score of zero. You just would have one and it would be in the four, it would be the 500, 600, wherever you land. But the, the important thing too is that the spread in the interval scale, it is less meaningful. So if I had a, had a credit score of 750 and you had a credit score of 775, what really do those 25 points actually mean? We don't actually have a, a ratio to tell us what that would uh, give us, you know, in that 25 point difference. Like maybe there's a cutoff for getting the loan 
uh, there's a number, but there's no way to say that the number below it would be significantly better or worse. ACT, SAT scores also have this interval scale because once you take the test, you would get a numbered scale. Uh, getting a zero would be improbable, and I don't think, uh, I mean, it, it, you would have to absolutely answer everything wrong, which is a statistical improbability, so there's no z real zero here, even though it's theoretically possible. Temperatures are really great, even though you might say, well, there's a zero degrees. Yeah, but, you know, that's not the end of that, and what is the ratio of the difference between 20 degrees and 30 degrees? What's what between 70 and 70 and 90 is very important for the human body, but you know, maybe 50 to 60 isn't. So again, interval scales are numbers that are ranked, but the spread's less meaningful. So the, the, the most important would be the ratio scale because the ratio takes the interval scale and throws in an absolute zero, and the ratios can be calculated. Uh, one, is, one is very important here if you had a point spread where the difference between a 70 and a 90 was actually mathematically meaningful. The ratio scale is wonderful. A lot of times people throw out a pretty simple example like grades, where you can have a 0% if you you know did it and then it didn't get any credit, where 100%, and we understand the, the differences between 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. But obviously this would be for mathematical problems, which should be graded without um, a mathematical problem if it's graded on correctness, doesn't have any biases to it, whereas somebody might say, hey, this isn't very precise, so it may not be a ratio scale. So ratio scales, essentially for their definition, they are, there's an actual zero, and the ratio is important between two of the intervals within its uh, system. So those are the four different levels of measurement. So for this table, we're going to actually find frequency, relative frequency, cumulative frequency, and cumulative relative frequency. Now, I would like you to have a basic calculator in front of you. This way, you'll be able to do some of the simple computations that will get us some percentages and decimals. So suppose you got a bunch of donated children's shoes in various sizes. The shoe sizes and their quantities are given in this table. From the table, list the data, determine sample size, the relative frequency, the cumulative frequency, and the cumulative relative frequency. So let's scroll down a little bit here and start off with kind of explaining what this means. The shoe sizes were between two and seven. Now the frequency tells you how many pairs of shoes you actually had. So the first row says you had three pairs of size two shoes. And then you had five pairs of size three shoes. So the frequency tells you how many sets of them do you have. It seems like the most we had was the size five shoes. So let's get started on filling out this table. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find out how many total shoes we have. So we have three of three of the size two shoes. And I'm gonna kind of create a data set based on this and because it's sometimes easy to see all the data. Now let's make a curly parenthesis like this. This is the start of our set notation. It's not a round or a hard bracket like you've probably seen in some algebra classes. This is the parenthesis used for the set notation. Now we have three sets of size two. So I'm gonna write the two three times. I have five sets of size three. So I'm gonna write this five times, put some commas in, and then I have the four three times, I have the five six times. All right. And then I have six twice. And then I have seven once. Now, to find my sample size, I just have to count up each of these elements. 
in the set. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So my n value, which stands for the number of elements inside my set, is 20. Another way I could have done this is just by adding the frequencies. 3 plus 5 is 8, plus 3 is 11, plus 6 is 17, 18, 19, 20. Now the relative frequency is when you take this, le this uh, number f, because anything in this column stands for f, and divide it by n. And the reason why we do that is sometimes you have a lot more than 20 data pieces. Let's say you have 200 or 400 or 1,000 data pieces. Well, then writing your data set would be pretty, it'd be pretty awkward. And it would be actually tough to do a lot of displays, but knowing the relative frequency can tell you how much of a percent you have of that type. So this would be taking the number 3 and dividing it by 20. And 3 divided by 20 gives you the decimal of 0.15, which in percentages would be 15%. Then if we go 5 divided by 20, which is taking the f and divide it by n, this will give you a total of 0.25, or 25% of your shoes donated are of this size. 3 divided by 20 is also going to be 15%. We can kind of grab that from the previous data point. Now this is going to be interesting because this is the first even number we have in the numerator. 6 divided by 20 gives you a decimal of 0.3. Now one of the dangers of writing this just as 0.3 is people might think it's 3%. But in fact, what I'd like to do is put a zero there. Now this kind of goes against some of the instructions you were ever given in a middle school math class about not writing a zero after the decimal. But we will do so just because it's easier to compare them versus the others. Also, converting from decimals to percents is a little easier once you make it look like a percent in percent format. By moving the, the, moving the decimal two spaces to the right, you can see that this is 30%. Continuing on, 2 divided by 20 is 0.1, or 1 tenth, also 10%. And 1 divided by 20 is 0.05, which is 5%. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a cumulative frequency chart. Now cumulative frequency is when you take the frequency and you add in the next row all of the previous rows. So this is an example of eight. So there are eight shoe or eight pairs of shoes that are either size two or size three. You could also say there are eight pairs of shoes that are less than or equal to three. Now if I add these three numbers, three plus five plus three, I get a total of 11, because six plus five is 11. You could say that there are 11 pairs of shoes of size two, three, and four, or you could say there are 11 pairs of shoes that are less than or equal to four. You could also say there are 11 pairs of shoes that are less than five, because it doesn't include the five. We probably want to avoid that just because you might infer that there are half sizes in these shoes. So three plus five plus three plus six is 17. You'll note that this kind of follows the same addition as we were doing to find our sample size 20. Also, you can take this number over here and just add the number in the next row in the frequency column to get to this number in the cumulative frequency column. And your total here is your sample size n. That's cumulative frequency. And cumulative frequency is useful for graphs such as the ogive. And the ogive is spelled O-G-I-V-E or O-Give. That's what it looks like. But the ogive is a type of graph that uses cumulative frequency. There will be some homework problems that talk about cumulative frequency. And there will be some homework problems that talk about cumulative relative frequency, where you take your summation of f, that little sideways m is a Greek letter, and that Greek letter says to add up the f values. Cumulative frequency is just adding this up and then 
for cumulative relative frequency, it's adding these up and dividing by n. So this would be 3 divided by 20. And 3 divided by 20 is the same as what we had for a relative frequency, which is 15%, or 0.15. Then what we have is 8 twentieths, which is 0.4. And we're going to add a 0. And this is something I like to call math grammar, because we're making it look nicer. And this math grammar is going to kind of like get us to compare things a lot easier. Then we have 11 twentieths, which is, we're now over 50%. This is 0.55. And this is then going to be 6 twentieths, which is then 0.85. And then we have, oops, I wrote 6 twentieths. I meant 17 twentieths. I'm sorry about that. Let me make a little fix. All right, easy fix. 17 twentieths, 85%. And then 19 twentieths, almost to 100%. We're at 0.95. And then when you do 20 twentieths, it gives you 1. But we're going to put that stylistic math grammar double zero on there, so you can see it's 100% of the data. So 100% of the data, or 100% of our shoe sizes, were size 7 and below. And this brings us to the end of the video, because we just have three formal definitions to write down. The relative frequency is the ratio, fraction or proportion, to the number of times a value in the data occurs in the set of all outcomes to the total number of outcomes, which means we're taking our times a value data occurs, f, and comparing that to all of the outcomes, n. So this is our f divided by n. That's relative frequency. And when the numbers get really big, we're going to exclusively use relative frequency, like we will in chapter 2. Cumulative frequency is adding up your values of f. Cumulative frequency is the accumulation of the previous relative frequencies. Cumulative relative frequency is going to be taking your sums of f and dividing it by n. Now, we are not going to cover chapter 1, section 4, but there is maybe some cool facts in there if you're kind of interested in statistical design and possible ethics of sampling and ethics of, of study. So, you know, browse through pages, the pages of that section if you're interested, but um, it really does kind of like open up some of the difficulties and complexities when trying to gather data and to do so ethically and also from a design standpoint valid in that way. Okay, well, thank you very much for getting through Chapter 1, Section 3, and all of Chapter 1. Thank you for watching, and you can now get started on the homework.